Hello and a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on this week's programme. Anti-Armenian sentiment on the rise in Turkey. The country's minority community has been caught in the crossfire since the start of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Do stay tuned for a report from our team on the ground. A conversation with James Foley's mother, an American journalist ruthlessly killed by the Islamic State group. I'll be speaking to Diane Foley about the trial of his alleged killers in the US. The two Brits have pleaded not guilty. Also coming up on our program this week, remembering legendary Iranian singer Mohammad Reza Shajarian. Last week, he died at the age of 80. To many in and out of the country, he was much more than a musician. He was the voice of Iran and his music a symbol for the opposition. Thank you for watching Middle East Matters. We start with Turkey and a community under threat. Since the start of the conflict over the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region, ethnic tensions have been growing inside the country. 35,000 to 70,000 Armenians still living in Turkey are facing rising hate speech as well as threats to their safety. Here's a report by our correspondent Shona Bhattacharya. Tatios Bebek has been a dentist for the last 40 years. He's a member of Turkey's historic Armenian community. Bebek says he never hides his ethnicity, though he's faced discrimination in the past. Ever since the late 19th century, Turkey's Armenian population says it's been the target of attacks. None of the 70,000 Armenians who remain has forgotten the events of the 1915 genocide that Ankara denies. In 2007, the murder of Frant Dink, the co-founder of the Turkish-Armenian Agos newspaper, drew international condemnation. The conflict between neighboring Armenia and Azerbaijan has raised tensions once again. Several incidents have been recorded over the past few weeks. Just after fighting picked up again in Nagorno-Karabakh late September, a convoy of Azerbaijan supporters drove by the Armenian Patriarchate of Istanbul, the head of the Armenian Orthodox Church in Turkey. Since then, the streets leading to the Patriarchate have been sealed off and police are standing by. But enhanced security measures aren't enough for Garo Pailan, one of three ethnic Armenian MPs. Ya bizim bütün kurumlarımızın kapısına polisleri koysanız ne olacak? Cumhurbaşkanı Erdoğan nefret söylemleri kullanıyor Ermeni halkına karşı. O açıdan bizim güvende olabileceğimiz tek şey bu nefret siyasetlerinin son bulması ve barış siyasetinin devreye geçmesidir. A call for peace that's been strongly criticized by rival political parties. They accuse Garo Pailan of being a traitor to the nation. This week, we're remembering American journalist James Foley, days ahead of what would have been his 47th birthday. James was one of the first Western hostages to be killed by the Islamic State group. And now, after a six-year-long wait, two of his alleged killers are in the U.S. facing trial. Both men who've been stripped of their U.K. nationality have pleaded not guilty to torture and murder. Now, to speak about this, I'd like to welcome... James's mother, Diane Foley, to the program. Diane, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us here on Middle East Matters. I can't imagine how heart-wrenching this trial is for you and, of course, the other relatives of the murdered captives. But hopefully, on a more positive note, it's uh, the first step in the pursuit of justice. Yes, we're incredibly grateful. We're very grateful that our Department of Justice was able to waive the death penalty so we could um, collaborate with the United Kingdom to begin 
um, this um, hope for some accountability on the horrific human rights crimes that are, have occurred in Syria, and certainly personally to our son and his colleagues. Now, earlier you said you're grateful, and of course we know that the UK and US governments do have a policy against negotiating with terrorists. And of course, this is not the case for France, where we are. Now, is there a part of you that somehow still resents the way the US, the Obama administration dealt with your son's case? Well, yes, I think it was a travesty, really, because the research does not show that no negotiation decreases um, the rate of um, kidnapping. I mean, we have hundreds of Americans who are taken hostage or unjustly detained every single year. So our stance against negotiating with such captors only means that we suffer worse outcomes, that um, our citizens and the British often um, do not come home. And of course, at the time, you were even threatened with prosecution for trying to raise money for James's ransom. It was it was very poorly handled. And I, I do feel uh, President Obama's administration recognized that. And in 2015, um, they did issue a presidential policy directive that at least gives us now an interagency fusion cell to handle hostage cases, as well as a presidential envoy and um, hostage recovery group at the White House. So there's an increase awareness of the need for an interagency approach, um, a more nuanced approach to bringing Americans home. So I'm very grateful for that progress. Now, Diane, speaking of poorly handled, let's now turn our attention to New York Times reporter Rukmini Kalimachi, who reported extensively on, of course, James's case and the Islamic State group. Your family has accused her of bullying and publishing lies. Well, to be honest, um, my my interaction with Rukmini was more limited and seemed reasonable to me. At the time, I appreciated that some journalists were at least looking at what was going on. Um, I believe one of our sons had an unfortunate experience with her, but I can't speak for that. And I did actually reach out to Rukmini Kalimachi for a statement earlier this weekend. Uh, this is what I got from her communication team. They said, with sensitive stories of this nature, we listen carefully to the family's concerns and try to address the issues that are most important to them. Now, Diane, despite everything that you and your family have been through, you continue to believe in the importance of reporting in war zones, which in James's case, of course, was mainly the Middle East. I think that um, non-biased investigative journalism is essential. Otherwise, we have no idea what is happening in the world. So I think our brave journalists uh, must be protected and um, encouraged to continue their um, important profession. I think it's the foundation of our democracy. I, I really applaud the work of our brave journalists. Well, you, you speak of brave journalist, but I want to speak of how brave you've been. You know, you endlessly advocated for James's freedom. You haven't stopped fighting for his legacy. You're speaking to us now yet. You've previously, previously even said that you feel like you let him down. Oh, I did. I had no idea how to get attention from our government for his plight. No idea. And um, it, I, I failed. I failed to get the attention at the highest levels. I did have had no idea how to do it. And so my hope now is by raising the issue of hostage taking um, at the highest levels is that we will have more success on prioritizing the return of our citizens who go, who go about the world um, as business people, journalists, aid workers, educators, whatever they're um, role may be, I think it's very important that governments have the back of their brave citizens who are innocent of any crimes. And your voice is certainly being heard, Diane. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us on Middle East Matters. Diane Foley, an incredibly strong woman who, after her son's ruthless killing, said, we have never been prouder of our son, Jim. He gave his life trying to expose the world to the suffering of the Syrian people.
Bird of Freedom, Sing For Me, Renew My Grief. Those are the lyrics of a song that has become synonymous with one of Iran's most revered musicians, Mohammad Reza Shajarian. The 80-year-old who popularized classical music died last week, leaving the country in mourning, and so thousands took to the streets to say their farewell to a man who had previously voiced his support for Iran's opposition, a musician who was then banned from performing in the Islamic Republic. An outpouring of emotion from Mohammad Reza Shajarian. <laughs> Within hours of his death, the singer's fans gathered and wept outside the Tehran hospital where he passed away. He was never appreciated as much as he deserved to be. A thousand years must go by for the value of such a person to be truly understood. He was an important person and was very precious to us. We're deeply upset. As night fell, the crowd paid tribute in the most fitting way. The crowd's singing turned to chanting, as slogans like death to dictator echoed across the streets. Social media videos showed police using batons to disperse the crowds. Though many see Shajarian as a national hero who revived Iran's traditional music, State TV gave little attention to his death. The singer initially supported Iran's movement against the American-backed Shah, resigning from his position with state radio ahead of the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Later on, he was banned from Iran's music scene. This after he condemned the government's violent crackdown on opposition protests in 2009. In the years that followed, Shajarian performed abroad and later returned to his home country. His body was flown to the northeastern holy city of Mashhad, where he was born. Mourners said goodbye with a song composed by Shajarian, The Dawnbird, an ode to freedom and revolution. Meanwhile, as seen in these images, authorities tried to restrict access to the ceremony. Well, that's it from us. Thank you for watching.